as your bride to treasured ones who love endures jealousy you cannot hide for in nations they will see and fear the day of the Lord come near Kina, El Kina a jealous God are you O Lord Kina, El Kina for Israel all the things you do consuming fire are you the love you have is true El Kina El Kina put me like a seal upon your heart a seal upon your arm love is strong and won't depart jealousy of heat and harm for the nation they'll see and fear day of the Lord come near Kina, El Kina Oh, a jealous God are you O Lord, Kina, El Kina For Israel all the things you do Consuming fire are you And the love you have is true El Kina I betroth you to me forever. Yada adeta donai, and you will know the Lord. Vaera sikli adonai, I betroth. Jealous God, are you, O Lord, Kina, El Kina? For Israel, all the things you do, consuming fire, are you? Oh, the love you have is true, El Kina, El Kina. All the day your hand is stretched to her, those chosen as your bride. Treasured ones, your love endure, jealousy you cannot hide. For the nation they will see and fear, the day of the Lord come near. Kina, El Kina, oh, a jealous God are you, O Lord. Kina, El Kina, for Israel all the things you do, consuming fire are you, the love you have is. Oh, El Kina, oh, be like a seal upon your heart, like a seal upon your arm. Love is strong and won't depart, jealousy of heat and harm. For the nation they will see and fear, they of the Lord come near. Kina, El Kina. Jealous God, are you, O Lord, Kina, El Kina? For Israel, all the things you do, consuming fire in you. The love you have is true, El Kina, El Kina, El Kina, El Kina. Shabbat Shalom. For those of you listening uh, on the internet, on the uh, YouTube channel, um, get other people to subscribe to the YouTube channel and give comments in the comment section. Got some really interesting comments in the comment section, which I like. I like to field questions, something I really enjoy. <clears throat> uh, like the videos, share the videos. What else is there? I think that's it. So whatever you can do to the, with the videos to, to get pictures out. That's all we want to do. We want to get Judaism as pictures out into the world. Whatever you can do to do that, do that. 
So, thank you for watching. And we have come through... My favorite book in the Torah, weirdly enough, is, is Bemidbar, Numbers. <clears throat> I've got 50 maps that I've done for the teachings for the book of Numbers, book, book of Bemidbar. And I just, I'm, I'm, there's so many really amazing, amazing stories that people don't spend a whole lot of time on in the book of Bemidbar. And about four years ago, I really started getting into the book of Numbers, and I really started seeing, it, it is amazing the stories that are in there. There's it, like, like lots of gems to mine in it, <clears throat> in the stories that people don't talk about much. Because they're weird. They are weird, weird stories. Like last week we did uh, Balak. We talked about the wizard, Bilam. Weird story. Everything about it is weird. Everything about it is upside down and backwards. You know, the book of Numbers is a lot like the book of Esther. Nothing makes sense. Everything's upside down and backwards and a, and a, a trick and a ploy and a puzzle and, and things you have to figure out. That's why I like it. So this week I have a teaching that is difficult to understand. <coughs> so I've tried to think about how to make it simple. And what we're going to be looking at is jealousy. God is jealous. But there's, there's two parts of jealousy. There's good jealousy and there's a bad jealousy. And I don't mean like human jealousy, being jealous of a wife who's committed adultery, a human. That's, that's not even in the scriptures. It's not even in the ballpark. The only jealousy that there is in the scriptures is God's jealousy and Israel's jealousy because they're reflecting God, because they're little, little models, little pictures of God walking around. That's the only reason it's in the Bible. So there's a good jealousy and a bad jealousy, a good jealousy of God and a bad jealousy of God. When I mean bad, I mean like horrible, dangerous, terrifying, you know, I don't mean bad like ethically bad. And we're going to look at both. But I want you to understand that we're not talking about human jealousy at all in any way, shape, or form. What we're talking about, what I'm going to be talking about is Judaism. That Judaism, I'm going to try to make this understandable, but it's, it's, it's deep, it's hard to understand. Judaism is the jealousy that we're supposed to have. Our jealousy for God is reflected by Judaism. God's jealousy for Israel is reflected in, guess what? The Torah, which is Judaism. So if, say here's God, here's us, if we're matching him by doing the Torah, we then match his kind of jealousy. Does that make sense so far? Yes? You got to say or shake your head or do something. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so let's go to the Torah portion. And I've titled the Torah, the Torah study, The Jealousy Within Israel. And here's why. <coughs> in all these words that are in the Torah portion, there's one phrase that is so weird, nobody translates it. Well, they all translate it, but they all translate it wrong. And I'm including the Jewish people. They all translate it wrong, and they say we're translating this wrong. Why? We don't know what it says. We don't know what it means. We don't know why it says this. So we'll just say this. <clears throat> and it's this phrase that is the jealousy within them. And that's what we're going to key in on, the jealousy within them. Because in the phrase, in the Torah portion, it's just like it's plugged in there. It makes no sense whatsoever. I'll show you what I mean. <clears throat> Numbers 25, 10 through 18. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Pinchas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in his jealousy, my jealousy inside them. What? What? It just makes no sense at all. Uh, Eleazar, I'm sorry, Pinchas, son of Eleazar, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in his jealousy. Okay, that makes sense. My jealousy inside them. 
that it does just make no sense in the context that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. That makes sense too. But there's that little phrase, my jealousy inside them, it's just plugged in there and it just makes zero sense. So I'm gonna to try to explain it. Therefore say, behold, I give, them my, I give him my covenant of shalom and it shall be for him and his seed after him, a brit kahunat olam. You ever heard that word kahuna, the big kahuna? Yeah, some, some Jewish dude in Hawaii <coughs> took the phrase kahuna, which means priesthood in Hebrew, and he, and he called some surfer, he's the big kahuna, which means the big, the, the big priest, the high priest. But everybody took it, they thought it was uh, Hawaiian. It's not Hawaiian, it's Hebrew. And it means priesthood. Kahuna is priesthood, kahunat is the priesthood of forever olam the kuhunat olam why because he was jealous for his god and made atonement for the sons of israel now the name of the slain man of israel who was slain with the midianite woman was zimri son of salu a prince of the father's house of simeon so he was a high guy he was a a high dude he was a prince in the tribe of simeon the name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby. I always thought it was Cosby, but then I checked the Hebrew. I don't know why I never did it before. It's Cosby. And <coughs> her name means I'm a liar or my lie. Because, you know, uh, uh, Bar, Bar Kochba? His real name was Bar Kosiva, which means it's the same word, Kosiva. Her name is Kazav, Kazavi. It's the same word, lie. His name meant Bar Kosiva, son of a liar. Her name means my liar, I'm a liar. Isn't that a trip, Cosby? Daughter of Tsur. Now we should be familiar with the word Tsur. Like Tsurus, oh my God, such Tsurus I have. It means problems, troubles. It's also the word translated in the New Testament as tribulation, the tribulation. Daughter of Tsur, we're going to look at Numbers 31.8. A head of people of a father's house in Midian. So she's the daughter of a king. He is a prince. And a prince and a princess get together and sin before God and in front of Moshe and in front of all of Israel just completely without any kind of restraint or shame or anything. So... God says, because of this, distress, trouble, saror, the Midianites. Why? Because the dude's father was, the, 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 the woman's father was named Tsar. His name is Tsur, Tsar, trouble. And so God says, okay, saror them, trouble them. They brought trouble to you, you bring trouble to them. Saror the Midianites. <clears throat> and strike them. Why? Because they sorored you. They brought soror to you with their frauds, with which they have defrauded you in the affair of Peor and the affair of Cosby, daughter of the Prince of Midian, their sister, their sister. So it calls her a princess, a sister who was slain on the day of the plague. So th this is not just some chick who wandered in. There's thousands of of not Midianite women, these are Moabite women. These are Moabite women. And they had just gone through all this horrible stuff with uh, Bilam and Balak, <coughs> and God turned it around. And so what happens? The Midianite women go and entice the Jewish men, and these guys... Cosby and Zimri go right in front of Moshe and start having sex. But they're not just having sex, they're worshiping the Moabite gods. I'm not even going to tell you how they worship the Moabite gods. It's not what I thought. It's not with sex. It's with something much worse. Horrible. Horrible. Yes. I, I got lost. Where's the Moab? 
Moab? Yeah, where's Moab in this? I'm, I'm talking about the affair of Peor. The oh, very last oh, thing we read, because of Peor. Okay. These were Midianite women. Okay? And 24,000 Jewish men were killed because of it. Now, after this horrible thing that happened at the affair of Pe Baal Peor, which is right on the edge, right on the lip of Israel, they're about to cross the Yardin. They're right there, and it happens. Right after that, this happens with Zimri and Cosby. And so they're like, what, what are you doing? We just went through this horrible thing, and now you're doing this. All right. So one guy stands up, and he skewers he skewers the couple while they're in the act. I'll talk about that a little more later. Now let's look at Numbers 31.8. Among their victims, now this is next week's Torah portion. In next week's Torah portion, they finally take vengeance on Midian, and then Moses is going to die. So it's the last thing he does before he dies. And when they take vengeance on the Midianites, they kill Bilam. Remember last week, Bilam, uh, Balak said, nah, I'm not paying you, go away. And so Bilam, he doesn't go back to Babylon where he lives. He goes back down south to Midian and says, here's how you can kill the Jews. And he tells them what to do. They raise up the women, they entice the men, and it works. Well, later on, next week's Torah portion, they finally kill Bilam. But look who else they kill. Among their victims were Evi, Rechem, Tsur, and Hur, and Reva, the five kings of Midian. This dude, Sur, is one of the five kings of Midian. And it's his daughter that this idiot from Simeon has sex with in front of everybody. Okay? You get what, what's going on here? This is not a small thing. This is on CNN. It's, everybody sees it. Everybody knows what's going on. So were all those guys Midianites? We're all who, what guys? Midianites. The ones that were killed? The five? The five? Yeah, those are the five kings of Midian. Okay. All right. <coughs> Numbers 25, 11. Back in last week's Torah portion. I'm sorry, this week's Torah portion. Pinchas ben Eleazar ben Aharon Hakohen Turn my wrath from Israel in his jealousy. Okay, that makes sense. He feels it. He feels his jealousy. He's jealous for God. He feels it. Okay, that makes sense. My jealousy within him makes no sense. So I did not destroy Israel in my jealousy. That makes sense. So here it is in Hebrew, and I've broken it down as cleanly as I can for you. Pinchas, the priest. Pinchas HaKohen, Hashiv et Hamati turned at is just means it's just it's a pointing it, there's, you can't translate it just turned my violence Hamati my violence from on al al means on from on Bnei Israel the children of Israel in his jealousy Bakano that makes sense in his jealousy God says woo bless that guy because he felt his he felt his jealousy, which was my jealousy. Perfect sense. But then God sticks this phrase in here, which makes zero sense. My jealousy within them. Et kinati. Et, you can't translate it. Just My jealousy, kinati, betocham. That means inside of them. My jealousy, my jealousy that God has inside all the Jews. Why does he say that here? It just doesn't make sense, does it? Does that make sense to you? Pincus the priest turned my violence from on the children of Israel and his jealousy. My jealousy inside them. Velo bekaliti, I'm sorry, velo kaliti, and not I destroy... Et b'nei Yisrael, the children of Israel, in my jealousy, b'kinati. <laughs> Everything makes sense in that phrase, in my opinion, except my jealousy inside them. Yes. Well, if he wants, if he wants to dwell in us, why would he have jealousy? 
you're, you're going four steps too far. Just reading the text as is, does it make sense? Does it make sense to have that phrase in there? Just reading it at face value. Yes or no? Yes, you have to make a presumption of what it means in order for it to make sense. Because if you just read it on a surface level, uh, pink, some guy turned my wrath from Israel in his jealousy. My jealousy inside them, so I wouldn't kill Israel in my jealousy. It just makes no sense. So, we have to know what God is saying because this is his word. And I think I figured it out, I believe. So I'm going to tell you what I believe God has shown me, and that's the best I can do. <coughs> now, in Numbers 25, two verses later, 13, God then says, He and his seed will have a covenant of priesthood forever. Why? Because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for Israel. He was jealous for his God. Makes perfect sense. I'm jealous for God. God hates what you're doing. I'm going to kill you. Okay, that makes some sense. All right. So God is jealous. And we all think we know what that means. You know, God is jealous. He says in Exodus 20, verse 5, Exodus 34, 14, Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 5 says the same thing. I, Yehovah, am El Kina. El means God. Kina means jealous. I am jealous God. I am God of jealous. My, uh, my, sorry. Mati, Hamat, <coughs> in the first line. Hamat. Like the word Hamas. Hamas means violence. So it's personal. My violence. Hamati. Okay. I saw Mati, and I thought I was, um, it, but okay, Hamati. All right. So he says in the same thing, and, and by the way, this is only four, there's about seven that all say the same thing. God is jealous. God is the God of jealousy. God in the description of God is jealousy. The Lord your God is a consuming fire, El Kina, God of jealousy. I, Yehovah, your God, am El Kina. I mean, this is God talking. God saying, I, Yehovah, my name, am El Kina. I am the God of jealousy. That is a strange phrase. Now, to prove to you that this is a weird phrase, the jealousy inside of them, we know this, betocham, we know what it means from this verse that we love so much in Exodus 25.8. Va'asu li mikdash v'shach anti betocham. <coughs> Sorry. And make for me, or make to me, a sanctuary, and I will dwell inside them. Betocham. Inside them. Not, you know, in their general vicinity. Make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell inside Israel. That's the purpose of the Mishkan. So God can live inside of us. Okay. It's the same word in numbers. Betocham. Mm -hmm. Inside them. In his jealousy. Et kinati, my jealousy, betocham. My jealousy inside them. So I'm just proving to you that that is what this says. My jealousy inside them. It just makes no sense. So obviously there, there is a je jealousy, or there's supposed to be a jealousy. In, and by the way, think about it. These are a bunch of people who just had sex with all different demons of Moab in the most disgusting ways you can think of. These two people were not the only two who did it. That's why God killed 24,000 of them. And inside those wonderful Jews who are doing this, they have betocham inside of them a jealousy. You follow what I'm saying? Even the worst of them have a jealousy inside of them. So there is a jealousy inside Israel 
that God wants, he wants it seen. He wants to show it. Yes? The word kina can also, if, it, if you change the form of it, it, it does mean vengeful. But not just straight up kina. But you have, to, you have to change the word a little bit. But yeah, it's very close. Yes, sir? I think I've heard it translated as anger or zeal. We're going to talk about zeal. Horrible translation. Horrible translation. I'll prove it to you. Everybody says zeal. The zeal of God has consumed me. It's the word kina. There's no such thing as zeal. It does not exist. It's jealousy. And I'll show it to you. I'll prove it to you. <clears throat> so here's our friend Pinchas doing his thing. Now, this is in last week's Torah, the end of last week's Torah portion, what he did. And I want you to know that there were, if you, if you uh, look at the Midrashim, there were 12 miracles that God did when Pinchas did this. There were 12 miracles that angels and God did in order for this to happen and to work properly. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'll just tell you this. Pinchas, when he skewered this couple while they were in the act, lifted them up on the spear like a shish kebab. So that would put the man where? On top or bottom? Well, he was on top. The scriptures say he was on top. So if he lifts it up, now the man is on the bottom, right? Okay. The, the Midrash, I don't know if it's true, says that the angel flipped them while he lifted them up so that they could see what it really looked like. So that the picture would be seen like a banner. Okay? That's just one of the miracles. But suffice it to say... This is what God wanted done. Now, here's a problem with this. There's a lot of problems with this. There's a lot of problems with this. I'll show you just one of them. <clears throat> in the Midrashim, it says, before the eyes of Moses. So this is, it says in the scriptures that, they, that Cosby and, and uh, Cosby and, um, what's his name? Zimri. Zimri so thank you. Zimri did this before the eyes of Moses. And so Rashi comments on that before the eyes of Moses and he says this. And by the way, Rashi gets this by culling together all the Midrashim and stuff that the, that the Jewish people had. They said to him, Moshe, is this one, this Cosby, is she forbidden to Zimri or is she permitted for him to have her? And if you say that it's forbidden to have her, who permitted you to have your wife, the daughter of Midian, the priest of Midian, Yitro? Oops. And it says that he just kind of lost his halakha. He lost his mind. He, and not lost his mind, but you know what I mean? Like lost his concentration and he was like, oh, oh. And he just kind of got timid because, I mean, this is really intense. Say, hey, you're do you did the same thing, hypocrite. Right. You had the, the daughter of the, the priest of Midian. What was her name? Uh, ah, Sipora. See, you had Sipora the, the, from the, the daughter. So how come you could have her, but I can't have her? What's, 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 what, you know, what makes you the, the king, the big important guy? And so Moses, hand, what it says is his hands went slack. In other words, he couldn't answer. Now, this was from God, and there's all, by the way, I'm just giving you two tiny, tiny little snippets from the rabbis, but there's dozens and dozens of pages of, of what really happened. And in one of the write-ups, uh, one of the Midrashim, Akedat Yitzhak, it says this, the lesson was that the practice of kanaut, kana, what's kana? Jealousy, the practice of like jealousy, showing jealousy, kanaut, that is making it a way of life. Let's call it zealous, so you can understand. The practice of being zealous or jealousy did not represent the spirit of the Torah. 
How about that? The reason is that Moshe had failed to instruct Pinchas and others to proceed against Zimri in a judicial manner, bringing him to trial. Why didn't he proceed in a judicial manner? Because they came and said, hey, you got to have uh, Tzipporah. Why can't he have her? And he just kind of, his hands dropped. This was from God. So it says, Moshe was in the habit of acting on God's instructions, obviously. But in this case, God prevented Moshe so that Pinchas could do what he was then, what was then necessary. Now I'm adding as a picture. The rabbis say God made Moshe just kind of lose it so that Pinchas would rise up and do this thing. Okay? That's why it's in the Bible. It's not there to show us a way of life. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why zealous is not good. It's one of the reasons. There's a lot of reasons. That's why zealous is not good. This is not zealous. This is him acting out the jealousy that is inside Israel as a picture. You get what I'm saying so far? Yeah. Yes? No? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Look at that picture down. That's a German woodcut or something. That's, I mean, that's how, that's how it's always been shown. Very flowy and, and romanticized down at the bottom. Romanticized and European wasn't like that. <coughs> so why was it done as a picture? Why did God have Pinchas rise up and show his, God's jealousy and skewer these two? That's my question. I'll show you why. What was the dude's father's name? Sorry. No, the girl's father's name. Sorry. Tsar or Tsur. Tsur. And then God says, Tsur them, Tsaror them, because they Tsarored you. That's why. It's a picture of the birth pangs. Now, if you guys don't know what the birth pangs is, the birth pangs is what the, is the title, the proper title of what believers call the tribulation. No such thing as the tribulation. Tribulation is not a, is not a noun. It's an adjective. Tsaror, Tsur. It's an adjective. It's not a noun. But they say the tribulation like it's a noun, like, like it's a thing. It's not a thing. <clears throat> the thing itself is called Hevle or Tsar. And they translate it tribulation, but it's actually birth pangs or trouble. Well, I'll give you another example. Mitzrayim, we came out of Egypt. What does Mitzrayim mean? Mitzar in. Uh, from the straits. From the straits. From the trouble. From the tribulation. Okay, right now, starting Thursday, began Bain Hamitzarim. Between the straits. Between the tribulations. 17th of Tammuz on Thursday. And then three weeks later on the 9th of Av is the other bookend of Bain HaMetzarim. We're in it right now. We are in the birth pangs right now for three weeks. And we have this picture that we live. It's the hottest time of the year. Everybody's freaking out. Nobody's concentrating. It's a horrible, hard time. You gotta, and you have to be extremely careful. Extremely careful. So the huge mistake that believers make when they're talking about this time period is they put it before the day of the Lord. There's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six of man, 6,000 years, and then day seven, God's day, God's Shabbat, a thousand years long, and every single verse about the birth pangs or the tsar, tsarim, puts it in that day or the day of the Lord. So here's the birth pangs. Seven years, literal years, and it's the first seven years of the day of the Lord. 
I have many, many, many teachings on that if, if you need more uh, explanation. But the reason that Pinchas skewered this couple and raised them up like a flag <coughs> was to do this picture. Because in the Tsarim, in the birth pangs, guess what God shows? Jealousy. That's what it says. It says that the time of God's jealousy is the birth pangs, is the Tsarim. And so God sends this dude, this woman, who's her father, the dude's name is Tsar, Tsur, birth pangs. And he says, birth pangs them because they birth pangs you. Now I'm going to show you the birth pangs. It's the time of my jealousy. He puts it in the Pinchas, and Pinchas does it as a picture. That's why it's in the Bible. It's to teach us. It's a picture. All right, Deuteronomy 4 says, When you become the father of children to children and remain long in the land and act corruptly, and you make an idol, the Lord will then scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the Gentiles. From there you will seek the Lord your God, and you'll find him. In tribulation, anguish, travail. These are different words that are used for the word sar. Some Bibles say tribulation, some say anguish, some say travail. All these things will overtake you in the latter days. Now this doesn't say the last day. It says the la latter days. Acharit hayamim. Which is a synonym for the day of the Lord. There's about a hundred passages that say that. That... Acharit Yamim equals the day of the Lord. And it says, then you'll return to God. Okay? So what do you expect should happen after Pinchas skewers them and lifts them up like a flag? What should, what should the Jews then do? All the, Tsar, all these things will overtake you in the latter days. That's what he's doing the picture of. Then you shall return to God. So what do you think the Jews will do after he skewers the couple? Teshuvah. Teshuvah. Return to God. Yeah, Teshuvah. Isaiah 5. He will lift up a sta Oh, that's weird. I never saw that. He will lift up a standard <laughs> to the dis... I didn't even see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The rabbis say he lifted them up like a, like a banner. And I just never even saw this. He will lift up a standard. I never made the connection. I'm sorry. Lift up a standard to the distant nation and whistle for it from the ends of the earth. Its arrows are sharp and its bows are bent. Their horses' hooves are considered as tribulation, anguish, travail. So this is coming army that is the Tsar. Their roaring is like lions and they roar like young lions. He will growl over him. When? In that day. What day? Well, right now, all we know is the last day, the seventh day. That's all we know right now. It doesn't say a day of the Lord here, but it's in that day. We know that's the day of the Lord. Like the roaring of the sea, if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sar, tribulation, and light is covered by its clouds. And again, if you don't know, if you've never studied the birth pangs, this is going to open your eyes to probably three quarters of the scripture because I am not exaggerating about three quarters of the scripture is about the birth pangs I'm not exaggerating all right so now we're going to look at a whole bunch of verses that define the birth pangs why because there are two words and you're going to see both words pop up over and over and over again Tsar obviously Tsar means anguish, travail, or birth pang. But then there's the word literally for birth pangs. It's chil, or chevle. Um, it means twisting, like an umbilical cord. Or a woman twisting in agony in birth. So it literally means to twist together, and it's chevle. Is, and by the way, what was the name of that movie? The Chosen. Not, this, not the show, the movie. The Chosen by Chaim Potak. It was uh, from the 80s, I believe. And there's a scene where the old Hasidic Rebbe is with his young boy. And they're in bed. And he's like, you know, saying goodnight to him. 
putting him to sleep. And this old Hasidic rabbi is singing and clapping his hands to the little boy. You know what he's singing? Hevle HaMashiach, Hevle HaMashiach, birth pangs of Messiah. That's what he's singing. Jews sing this because it's such a big doctrine. But most believers don't even know what it is. They call it the tribulation, and it's not. It's the birth pangs of Messiah. So, Exodus 15, anguish, heal, has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. This is talking about when, you know, we cross through the Reed Sea. Chiefs of Edom were dismayed, leaders of Moab, trembling grips them, inhabitants of Canaan. How many nations did it mention there? Come on, how many nations did it mention? Okay, you're going to see them pop up again, going through the birth pangs. <coughs> Psalm 48, <clears throat> great is the Lord in the city of our God, his holy mountain. The kings of the earth gathered themselves together, trembling seized them, anguish, heal, as of a woman giving birth. This is the birth pangs. Who is going to go into birth pangs? Come on, you got to pay attention, guys. Who's going into birth pangs here? Come on, answer out loud. Come on, kings of the earth, all of them, all seventy nations. Isaiah twenty-one: A harsh vision has been shown to me. Go up, Persia, lay siege, Media. My loins are full of anguish. Pains have seized me like Tsiri. My trouble, tribulation, as of a woman in labor. Who goes into birth pangs here? Persia, maybe. Nope. Come on. Who goes into birth pangs here? Me, the prophet. The prophet. He sees it. He's been taken there in the spirit and he sees it. Ah! And he goes into birth pangs. Why? Because Persia and Media are coming. Okay? Well, would that be him himself? God. This no, it this this is God. the prophet. Look, this is the prophet. He's where, right, where, wouldn't he be speaking for God? Saying God is a God. harsh no. A harsh vision has been shown okay. Okay. to me. Right. And he sees it. Speaking it's a horrible vision. And he goes into birth pains. Now media right. is that median the same? Say media? Mid, median? Yeah, media. I don't know. Media. Persia, Me Medo Persia. Yeah. Okay, Isaiah 26. Oh Lord, this is one of my favorite verses. Oh Lord, they sought you, Betsar. When did they se se seek God? In the birth pangs. In the birth pangs. In, but, in, Tsar. In trouble, tribulation. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening, that means spanking, was on them as the pregnant woman approaches the time. To give birth, she tachil. She has, this is the word chevle. It's just a different form. She has chevle. She has pangs and cries out. Chavale, her birth pangs. Says it twice. Her birth pangs. We were pregnant. Chalano, says it a third time. We were pregnant. We were in our birth pangs. We gave birth, as it were, to nothing, to wind. We couldn't accomplish deliverance. This is bad. This is, they're up against it. They're just, just, seems like there's no hope. This is four words in one passage for the birth pangs. Isn't that amazing? It describes it for us so clearly in the Hebrew. Isaiah 66. Before Tahil, her birth pangs, she brought forth. It, it doesn't literally mean before they came. It means like, like they came and bam, it happened real fast. Um, she brought forth, before Chedel, birth pangs come to her, she gave birth to a boy. Can Hayuchal, same word, just a different form, birth, bang, birth pangs be to a land in one day, if a nation is born at once, that she Chala, same word, not like Chala bread. <laughs> She chala travails also. She gives birth, Zion, to her sons. 
All right, this has it four, what, one, two, three, four times in one verse about Israel going through birth pangs, but here they actually produce a child. Jeremiah 4, a destroyer of nations has gone. By the way, there's more verses in Jeremiah about the birth pangs than any other book in the Bible. Jeremiah 4, a destroyer of nations has gone out from his place in that day. When? In the day of the Lord. In that day. In the day of the Lord. For I heard a cry as of a chola, a woman in birth pangs. The tsar of one giving birth to her first child. The cry of the daughter of Zion. So she is who? Who's going into birth pangs here? Zion, the Jewish people. She's going into birth pangs. And she produces her first child. The firstborn son. Jeremiah 6, a people coming from the north, they're cruel and without mercy for the battle against you, daughter of Zion. All right, this is again Zion, again. Anguished, Sarah has seized us. Pain, heal of a woman giving birth. Who goes into birth pains in Jeremiah 6? Zion. Zion. Jeremiah 13, those, see those coming from the north. What will you say when he appoints over you former friends to be over you? Will not Chabalim pangs take hold of you like a woman giving birth? So again, this is Zion. doesn't say it here, but this is Zion. Jeremiah 22, you who dwell in Lebanon. Now this is not Lebanon. What is Lebanon in the Bible? Do you remember? It's the temple. So you got to be careful, like if Lebanon is Lebanon, like the actual nation, it'll give you some context. If there's no context, it's talking about the big, tall, white thing. White, Le Levan means white. Big, tall, white thing, the highest white there is. What's that? Zion, the temple. So this is a code word for Zion uh, when it says Lebanon here. Which one are we on? Uh, what? 22, you who dwell in Lebanon, nested in the high cedars, how you will groan when chabalim, birth pangs, come upon you. Chil, pangs, as a woman giving birth. Again, this is Zion. Jeremiah 30, I've heard the sound of terror. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why then do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? This isn't heel, childbirth, it's just like giving birth, like uh, ye, uh, ye, yeled, like uh, having birth, as a woman in childbirth. Alas, for that day, what? That day, the day of the Lord, is great. There's nothing like it. It is the time of Jacob's tzarah, Jacob's tribulation or trouble, but he will be saved out of it. Every verse we've seen so far, except for one, tells us straight up when will the birth pangs be in that day and this is what Jews have taught for 4,000 years the, that day the day of the Lord it's not the Lord coming back it's a thousand years long it's what we call the Messianic Kingdom or God's Shabbat and it's the focus of the entire scriptures Jeremiah 48. Now it's against Moab. 48. The hearts of the mighty men of Moab in that day will be like the heart of a woman in Metzerah, in, in, in Sarah. He has become arrogant toward the Lord. So here, Moab. Jeremiah 49. One chapter later. It's against Edom. Same words. He will swoop like an eagle in the hearts of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be like the heart of a woman in Sarah, birth pangs. Jeremiah 50, which is against Babylon. Behold, the people is coming from the north, cruel and without mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. We saw this word for word in Jeremiah 6. For the battle against you, O daughter of... Here it says daughter of Babylon. Up here in Jeremiah chapter 6, same words, but it says against you, O daughter of Zion. 
But here it says against daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard the rumor about them and his hands go limp. Distress, tribulation has gripped him. Heal like a woman giving birth. Now, when they came and they said, hey, Moses, how come you get to have Zipporah, but he can't have the daughter of Tsar? Huh? What happened to him? His hands went limp. That's why he did, that's why God did that as a picture of the birth pangs. It's like, huh, I just have no strength. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Well, that's okay. I'll take care of it. And he lifts them up. So that's why that happened to Moshe as a picture as well. Okay. Hoshea 13, the iniquity of Ephraim. Who's Ephraim? Okay, who is that? Like in the Bible, who is, who is the people of Ephraim? Northern Israel? Right, northern Israel. The northern ten tribes. The iniquity of northern Israel is bound up, his sin. The birth pangs, Hevle, come upon him. He is not a wise son, for it is not the time to delay at the opening of the womb. So who goes into birth pangs in uh, Hoshea? Israel. Mika 4, now why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you or has your counselor perished? For Heel has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. Chuli, travail to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman giving birth. Who's going into birth pangs in Mika? Zion. Zion. Okay, so now we're going to start having a problem in the verses. And that is because of the bottom line of this teaching. Nowadays, because of the horrible, horrible doctrine that's come into the body of Messiah, it is almost impossible to say Jews and Gentiles. You can't even say it anymore. You have to say Judah, and they'll say, you have to say Ephraim, or Israel. The Gentiles are not Israel. Absolutely not Israel. They come into the Jewish thing through Yeshua. There's Judah, which is part of Israel, and there's Ephraim, which is part of Israel. They are synonymous. They are the same thing. They're just different parts of the nation. One's north, one's south. The north were taken away. The south still hang around, sort of, but they're kind of blown to shreds. That's all. And if you don't understand that, you can't understand the rest of the teaching. So we're going to come up against that in a bit. In a bit. Matthew 24. Now I can't translate it in Hebrew. You're going to have to do it. I've given you the two words, Hevle and Sar. And you're going to have to decide which one, is, which one it is. And you can't look it up in the Hebrew New Testament because they're guessing. They're guessing, just like everybody else guesses. There is no Hebrew New Testament that we have, so we can tell. The only thing we can do is go by what it says in the Torah. So it, it's, your guess is as good as mine. But I've given you the facts, so you should be able to tell, I think. Matthew 24. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of battles. Remember what it said about the king of Babylon? He'll hear the rumor of them coming from the north, and ah, he goes into birth pangs. Zion will hear the rumor of the Medes coming and blah, they go into birth pains. <coughs> you like that, huh? Nation will rise against nation and in various places famines and earthquakes. This is the first part or the beginning of, and here's where the New Testament says, tribulation. So what is it? Is it Sarim or is it Hevle? This is the beginning of birth pangs. What do you think? Probably have that. What do you think? Your guess is as good as mine. Say something. Yeah. What do you think? Six of one have done the other. Same thing. Right. John 16. Whenever a woman is in birth pangs. Okay. Now, if we can figure out what he's quoting, we can know which one it is. So which one do you think it is? When a woman is in birth pangs. 
Which one do you think he's quoting? Which one of these do you think he's quoting? No, I mean, which verse? Which verses? I think it's this one. Before her birth pangs, she brought forth. Before birth pangs came to her, she gave birth to a boy. I think that's what he's quoting. So this has tachil, chevel, chayuchal. So it's chevle. That's my guess. Again, my guess is as good as yours. You will, uh, sorry, whenever a woman is in birth pangs, she has sorrow. But when she gives birth to the child, she doesn't remember that anguish anymore for joy that a child has been born. So I believe this is Hevle. All right, First Thessalonians 5. Now as to the times and the epochs, brothers, I don't need to write to you anything because you know perfectly well. I don't need to send you any letters or any doctrine because you know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Not the Lord. The Lord does not come like a thief in the night. That is false doctrine. The day of the Lord comes like a thief. And how long is the day of the Lord? A thousand years. A thousand years. And the, it comes at the beginning with the birth pangs. That's the first thing that happens in the day of the Lord. The resurrection and on the same 24-hour day, Rosh Hashanah, the year 6001, resurrection and immediately the birth pang starts. Same day. That's the beginning of the birth pangs. And it's the beginning of the day of the Lord. So here, he says, I don't need to tell you about this stuff because you know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Not the Lord. While they are saying peace and safety, and this is, by the way, in the book of Jeremiah, word for word, then sudden destruction will come upon them like Sarim or Hevle, take your pick, upon a woman with child. What do you think? Which one do you think it is here? I just gave you the clue. It's word for word in Jeremiah, and it is Hevle. So the, the trick is that you've got to know what he's quoting. If you can know what is quoted in the New Testament, then you can know what the word is in Hebrew. Otherwise, it's just a guess. Yes, sir. In 1 Thessalonians, he's talking about the first says, mm-hmm. While they are saying peace and safety, <laughs> then birth pangs comes to them at the very beginning of the first seven years. But then it says, right after that, I don't have it here, it says, and they shall not escape. Then it says, but you brothers are not in darkness that this day should overtake you. You're not in darkness that it should overtake you. You're all sons of light. You won't be surprised. You're all sons of light and sons of day so that the day of the Lord will not come to you as a thief. All right, Revelation 12. Now, Revelation 12 takes a whole bunch of scriptures and mushes them together. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Who is that? Um, No, Rachel's the sun. uh, Who's the... Sorry, Rachel's the moon. I'm sorry. Who's the sun? Jacob. Jacob. Who are the 12 stars? The 12 tribes. So who is this woman? It's Israel. Rachel, Jacob, 12 sons. That's Israel. A great sign appearing in heaven. Israel. And um, And she, she, Israel, was with child. And she, Israel, cried out being in birth pangs. So what do you think it is? Hevle or Tsar? And in tribulation to give birth. Now here there's two different words. So I think the first one is Hevle. She's in Hevle and she's in travail. Tribulation, Tsar, to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, this giant red dragon. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. She's like in labor. She's about to give birth. 
Baby's going to pop out, and right when that baby pops out, he's going to eat it up. That's what he wants to do. So that he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And this is why it's so important that you know the birth pangs. Why? Because Israel is going to give birth to Yeshua in the day of the Lord. In other words, all of Israel is going to be born again. All of Israel. But it's going to take the birth pangs to do it. Yes, sir. Um, I, the question is, what's the great red dragon? I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to substantiate it or anything like that. I've given this teaching many times about the great red dragon. It's Rome. Edom. Edom. Rome. But that's a story for another time. So, I'm, I'm sorry, what? They're going to be waiting for Yeshua to come back. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with Yeshua coming back. Israel is going to give birth to the Messiah. What that means is all of Israel is going to be born again. All of Israel. They're all going to have Yeshua come out of them. That's what the purpose of... The, that's why it's called birth pangs. You know, back in the... Somebody told me this, and I just don't know whether to believe it or not. But back in the 90s, you remember... Um, uh, that, but that black guy who had the big baggy pants that he would dance. Hammer, time. hammer, hammer, hammer time, baby. Okay. <clears throat> they started wearing pants like that. The men started wearing pants like that before he did that. And they were called, <laughs> at least this is what I was told from somebody in Israel, they were called birth pangs pants. <laughs> because they were baggy and the men could give birth and they were wearing them as because they were like we want Moshiach now we want Moshiach now so they just started wearing birth pangs pants so as a sign of that these scriptures that they all knew were going to come true any moment and Israel's going to give birth to the Messiah so you get out of your head what you've got in your head about Yeshua coming back that, that has nothing to do with this at all Nothing. This is about the day of the Lord and the beginning of the day of the Lord, and it's the Jewish... I mean, think about this. We, the, quote, church has had 2,000 years to give birth to Yeshua, and they didn't do it. It's going to take the Jewish people to do it, to bring Yeshua into the world. Yeshua's not in the world. Yeshua has nothing to do with this world. Not in, in churches, not in Catholicism or Protestantism or Messianic Judaism or anything. We, we are all just feeling our way along the wall like blind men. The only people who have what's real is the rabbis and sages who God gave it to thousands of years ago. And they wrote it down and all we got to do is study it. That's all we got to do. Nobody else has it. And so because of that, because Judaism, quote Judaism, has been kicked out of the body of Messiah, why hasn't the, quote, church given birth to Yeshua? Why? Because they're not Jewish and they don't do Judaism. And they don't have what Zion, what Israel has, so they can give birth to the Messiah. That's why it's called birth pangs. Because God... Israel is going to bring Yeshua into the world. But it's going to be through the horrible things you read. I'll just say in the book of Revelation. Because that's a year by year explanation of the birth pangs. That's all the book of Revelation is. And it's awful. It's horrible. But the purpose is going to bring Yeshua into the world. That ultimately is why Pinchas, Pinchas skewered that couple to give a picture and, and by the way this is just the beginning to give a picture to the world of the birth pangs this is when God gets jealous the birth pangs are God's jealousy now here's the trip the very last thing that Moshe did was a picture of the very last thing that God's going to do What's the very last thing that God's going to do? Bring the day of the Lord. Yes? It's the last day. 
There's six days for man. And then what? W wake up, guys. There's six days for man. And then what? God's day. The last day. The last day. It's called the last day many, many times. Acharit hayamim. The last day. So the very last thing Moshe did is the very last thing God's going to do. Well, guess what it is? It's avenge the Jews by killing Midianites. Mm -hmm. The very last thing Moshe did, Numbers 31, in next week's Torah portion, the Lord spoke to Moshe, take vengeance on Midian, not Moab, Midian, for the sons of Israel. Afterward, that's when you'll die. So, before you die, what's he going to do? <laughs> God. After, afterwards, you will be gathered to your people. That means you'll die. So, right before Moshe dies, what's his job? Take vengeance on Midian. Take, go, take vengeance on Midian. Bring the tzur to them. Yes? Okay. That's why God did it the way he did it. All right. So, it's in the last day, and it's the last thing God does. Zechariah 12, in that day, in what day? Day of the Lord. I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood. If you get a fire pot and throw it among pieces of wood, what's going to happen? It's going to roll and burn up everything. That's the Jews. In the last day, they're going to fight like fire, like fire, burning up the enemies. And a flaming torch among sheaves that consume on the right and the left all the surrounding peoples. Okay, this is after all of Israel is born again. After they go through the horrors of the birth pangs. Then at the end of it, then they're going to fight. Because the birth pangs takes just, I don't know what to say. It's just my hands drop. I got, I've got no strength. And then they are saved, given salvation. And then they fight. Zechariah 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. So if it's a day coming for the Lord, what would you call that day? Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. When the spoils will be divided among you, for I gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, then the, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. So this is at the end of the birth pangs. We've gone through seven years, and now we're at the end of the seven years, and then God comes to fight. But notice it doesn't say he comes physically yet. It says... <coughs> I'll gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. That doesn't mean physically. That means this. Oh, this. That means he's going to fight through the Jews. And I, and I ran out of space, so I only put this verse. But there's about ten of them that say God's going to cause the Jewish people, both Ephraim and Judah, to fight all the surrounding nations. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's a event than yes, Jesus. as I said, that one has nothing to do with the other. So there's a separate event. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's called birth pangs. It takes time. It can be seven years, but the literal coming is what we're about to to look at. The literal coming <laughs> is after those seven years. It's like at the very end, the last, right, the yeah, very very end of the seven years. Actually, the very last day of the seven years. Yom Kippur, the year 6008, if you're interested. But <clears throat> he says here, it's in the day of the Lord. Then it says, I'll gather all the Gentiles. How many nations are there? 70. 70. Going to gather all 70 nations to Jerusalem to battle. Well, who's going to battle them? Israel. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations through Israel. But then after that, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now the Lord is literally physically coming to earth. 
and he stands on the Mount of Olives and it will split from east to west and you will flee by the valley of my mountains. Then the Lord will come and all the holy ones with him that you recognize from Revelation chapter 19. All right, so this is... I can't hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody up in the Hagar will come. Okay, so I just want you to see that it's Israel fighting. Israel does the fighting. After they're just blown to shreds. Then they give birth to the Messiah, finally. That means they're born again. That means all of Israel's born again. That's what that means. And then they fight. Zephaniah 1. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them in the day of the Lord's anger. That's the day of the Lord. And all the earth will be devoured by the fire. Oh! All the earth will be devoured by what? Jealousy. The fire of his jealousy. Remember it said that Israel would be like a, a big ball of fire he's just throw into a standing grain or, or, or chaff or something like that. And it just rolls and it just burns everything up. That's God's jealousy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, hold on. Jealousy in the Bible is fire. I mean, you felt it, I guess. You probably felt it. No, I felt it. When I, you know, I see some dude looking at my wife. Fire. Well, that Fire. Burn with Say it again. There's a phrase, burn, with jealousy. burn with jealousy. That's Well, this is where it comes from. And the day of the Lord... The day of the Lord's anger is the fire of his jealousy. Somebody's got to show it. Okay. Um, I'm thinking of the word kinah, back to kinah, and it starts with a kuf. Kinah starts with a kuf. And the kuf, it, um, you know how it means monkey. Yeah. But one yeah. of the things that I found was that it is like an uncontrolled it's an uncontrolled yeah, person. a kuf is, it means monkey, but it literally means uncontrolled, like a monkey. So and it means like an uncontrolled person. So, so when you see the word kina, you're looking at that kuf and you're going, it's like an uncontrolled, uncontrolled fire. fire uncontrolled yes, jealousy. yes. Okay. So now we're starting to pull together why God had Pinchas do what he did as a picture. And do it from some. With, with steward some chick whose dad's name is birth pangs and then he raises them up like a banner in the in in god's jealousy which is inside of him mm -hmm. but then it's a jealousy that god says is in all of israel right. whatever that is it's in all of israel okay i know it's a lot to tie together but i'm doing the best i can so here's what we've seen the jealousy inside of israel will be seen when God's jealousy is seen. When's God's jealousy going to be seen? End of, the day of the Lord. End of the day of the Lord. Okay? That's when the jealousy of Israel is going to be seen. The jealousy inside Israel is only going to be seen, be seen then. Now, let me tell you what that means in English, because that's like all mystical, metaphorical talk. Here's what it means. There's not going to be any more churches. There's not going to be any more churches. No baptismal tanks. No Christians. There'll be believers that are Jews and Gentiles, but no, quote, Christians. There's not going to be any hymnals. <clears throat> All there's going to be left once God's fire of jealousy burns up everything, all that's going to be left is that jealousy inside Israel, which is Torah. That's all that's going to be left. So, what I mean, and, and I'm, you know, it's hard to talk about this because everybody thinks, listen, I had a assistant pastor recently, after hearing me teach and teach and teach and teach, say, oh, Michael has a, a deep hatred of Christians. Hmm. I, I have more love for Gentile believers than Gentile believers do because I know where I'm trying to take them. They don't. I'm a Jew. I'm a rabbi trying to take them into the kingdom. I know what I'm doing. So it's driven solely, believe me, 
solely by love. I would not do this. I wouldn't talk to Gentiles if I didn't have to. But I'm driven to because I have so much love to get everybody to do Judaism so they can know God. I just want people to know God. That's it. But the problem with that is we have to let go of all the garbage that we're dragging along with us into the kingdom. We all do. We all do. All that garbage. False doctrine, false beliefs, and all of it. 100% of it comes from, quote, Christianity as a religion. The religion of Christianity. I'm sorry to say. I think people get confused, with me anyway, I know they do, they confuse my hatred of Christianity, the doctrine, thinking it's hatred of yes. people. Yes, people get, people always get confused with hatred of false doctrine and they think it's hatred for believers and it's right. not not at all at least for me I can say that right. so what I want you to see is this there is a jealousy inside us Jews and God wants it to come out I think it's latent and it's going to get woken up you think it's latent and it's going to get woken up yeah I, th I think so too and I think it has to because we're about three years away, four years away from that. We're very, very, very close, whether it's three years or four years or whatever. We're very, very, very close to the birth pangs. So what, like God's going to flip a switch when we hit the day of the Lord and somehow everything's going to magically change? It's not going to happen. We have to go into it changing. We have to, it's, it's a long, I mean, it's just like birth pangs. These are birth pangs. That's contractions. That's horror. That's screaming and yelling and hocking and spitting and hitting the husband. Get out of my face. And, and it, you know, which last, it can last for you know, a couple days. Usually lasts for about uh, 12 hours, something like that. But that's seven years in real time. Well, what's going to happen before the birth pangs? Nausea, anger, hormones, throwing up, morning sickness, can't get up, back pains. That's, what we're, that's what's happening now. We're not even in like Braxton Hicks contractions. None of this has started. All we're experiencing is nausea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's like you know, when a woman's pregnant, she's about eight months, nine months. It's getting close, and things are just bad. It's just bad. That's where we're at right now. We are not in the birth pangs. And by the way, there is no other time period in the Bible at all ever specified other than the birth pangs. There are 70 weeks given for the Jewish people. The final week is the birth pangs. And there is no other time period ever given in the scriptures. And all the scriptures that give a seven year period is about those birth pangs. Yes, sir? Yes, it's yeah. uh, 70 weeks from Daniel, uh, Daniel, not 9. Yes, Daniel 9, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Daniel 9, 24. The 70 weeks of Daniel. Well, there is no other time period. So there's not like a time period before the birth pangs or time period leading up to the day of the Lord. It doesn't exist. It's just the six days. Yes, well, but there are people, a lot of people, who say there's another time period. There isn't. This is all there is. Well, was that a I didn't see that. Well, it was a comment. Okay. When you talking about the jealousy being the when, when you talk about the jealousy being inside of Israel, yes. I think we see it, even though it's not come to total fruition, in the way that the Israelis are defend their land. Defend yes. Their I think that is. Yes. What sets them apart. Yes. When, when Israel defends their land, you see a tiny, tiny little bit of that jealousy. But it's, it is. It's just a glimmer. It's nothing. Nothing like. Yes. And it's nothing like the jealousy that God wants to come up and be seen. The jealousy inside us. 
Okay. So I mean, this is now kind of like the flip side. We've looked at the birth pains. We've looked at that being called the fire of God's jealousy. But now how about just jealousy that God's jealous for Israel? I mean, that's the whole point of this thing. God isn't jealous for Christians. I'm sorry. He's not. God has no jealousy for anybody on this planet but one woman, Israel. And if Gentiles come into that, hey, more the merrier. They're part of that bride. That bride has always been the bride. His bride is Israel. And he says it 50 times in the, in the Tanakh that Israel is his bride. And he will never divorce her. Never. He'll take others to come be part of her. But he will never divorce her. Why? Because he's so passionately in love with Israel. Why? Don't have a clue. But that's the truth. All right, so Hoshea, this prophet in the north. Yeah, I don't know why. This prophet in the north, Hoshea, God told him to go marry a hooker. Breaking so many laws of the Torah. But God told him to do it. Hoshea, the word of the Lord which came to Hoshea ben Be'eri. When the Lord first spoke through Hoshea, the very first thing God said to Hoshea, go, take for yourself a wife who's a, who's a hua. Go take a hua for your wife. That's what it says in Hebrew. It doesn't say a woman of harley trees. It's just, she's a hooker. Go get her and marry her. And she's got kids through adultery. So she's got, of course he didn't want to do it, but he did it. So he, she, not only is she a hooker, but she's gotten pregnant through some guys and she's got kids through these other guys. And God tells his prophet, take her and love her. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Please. Okay. And then in chapter 2, he says it will come about in that day, in the day of the Lord, that Israel, and by the way, he was from northern Israel, not Judah. He was from Ephraim, this prophet Hoshea. He prophesied to the northern dudes who didn't, I can't even describe to you the kind of filthy, disgusting idolatry they did all the Gentile ways they did. But he was a prophet to them. And he says, it will come about in that day that you, Israel, northern Israel, you will call me Ishi, my man. You're not going to call me Baali anymore. My Baal, my master. My Baal, my God, the Gentile God. In that day, um, think about what he's saying. You're not going to call me Yehovah Baali anymore. They've found statues of women and men, Asherot, Asherim, Asherot of women and Baalim of men that say Yehovah on it. What? Yeah, Yehovah Asherah, Yehovah Baal, Yehovah Baal uh, Zavach. So they, 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 were, they had idols, demons. And they would, they were, they'd say, we're worshiping Yehovah. What's, who is he? He's my Baal. And so he said, no, no, no more of that stuff. No more of that churches and steeples and baptismal tanks and all that. It's done. We're done. You're going to call me my man, Ishi. In that day, in that day, in the day of the Lord, I will make a covenant for them. And I will eliminate war from the land. And I'll betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and grace and compassion. I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you'll know the Lord. When will they know the Lord? In that day. In that day. Why? Because they went through the birth pains. Proverbs 6. Jealousy and rage is a... You ever wonder why this is in the Bible? Jealousy and rage is a man. Why is that in the Bible? It's about God. Jealousy and rage is God. And he will not have compassion on the day 
of vengeance, the day of the Lord. This is about God. It's not about people. He will not accept any... You cannot buy him off. Nobody is going to be able to buy God off. God says, I want Judaism done. Yes, but, but we're going to worship you as unto the Lord. We're going to do Christmas as unto the Lord. We're going to do Easter as unto the Lord. Sorry, you can't buy me off. That's not what I said to do. Sorry. He will not accept any settlement or be satisfied even with a gigantic gift. Our church has 50,000 people and we're singing all the hymns as unto the Lord. Sorry, not what I asked for. Proverbs 27, wrath is fierce and anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? This is about God, it's not about people. God has a jealousy and nobody is going to be able to stand before it. When it starts coming out of the Jews in the day of the Lord, it's going to be like fire among sheaves. <laughs> Burn everything up. And you're worried about who's the president going to be? You're worried about politics? You're worried about, I mean, come on. Okay, fine. You know, take a little interest in it, but give me a break. This is coming. This is coming. And people, believers are worried about who the president is going to be. Like it's going to, who cares? It's not going to change a single thing. Not anything. Nothing. Song of Solomon 8. I love that. And you know what? I never understood this verse until yesterday. I've always <laughs> loved it. It like hit me like, ooh, I love that verse. Have no idea what it means. <laughs> Now I think I know what it means, I think. Song of Solomon 8. Put me like a seal over your heart. Like a seal on your arm. It says twice in, in Ephesians that, the, that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, I knew that. But then it says love is as strong as death. How, who needs death associated with love? That's not pretty. Love is as strong as death. Because jealousy is severe as hell. Ugh, that's not pretty. But it's the truth. That's equating jealousy with love. Yeah, it's equating jealousy with love. And it says it's so harsh, it's so fierce, that it kills everything and everybody. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's love. Yeah. Its flames are the flames of fire, the flame of of the Lord. Yes. Like that scripture you and I, the, um, a, loud a loud rebuke is better than silent, silent love. Silent, uh, yes. Uh, but I want you to see this is a love poem. Song of Solomon is a love poem between Israel and God. And God says, I am so jealous for Israel that I will kill anybody who dares to touch her. That's what he's saying. God will kill anybody who dares to lust after Israel. Oh, really? You mean be jealous of Israel and want what Israel has? Is that what you mean? You mean like people want what she has? Ooh, I want that. I want her. I want to be called a Jew. And this inflames God. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's his love. Nobody can say, I'm a part of the bride. Unless they're part of that bride. That bride is Israel. And the other people can't come and say, I am part of the bride. What made you a part of the bride? The Lord Jesus Christ's blood. How did that happen? It says in Ephesians that you, if you're a Gentile, come into the commonwealth of Israel and the temple and the sacrifices and the Torah and the covenants and the promises through the blood of Yeshua. That's what you're in. Those five things. Oh, and sorry, I missed one. And hope. That's what you're in. You don't come and be, you don't say, I'm the bride because of the blood of Yeshua. Scriptures never say that. The bride is Israel and he is so jealous for her 
But we also have that jealousy inside of us. And it looks just like his jealousy. They look the same. They're Torah. The seal on the heart, on the heart and the arm remind me of the breastpiece and the filling. Yes, yes. The rabbis say that that seal over your heart and the seal on your arm is the breastpiece, the choshen, that's over the heart, and the tefillin on the arm. Yes. So we should have the same jealousy for Israel that God does. It's that simple. Romans 10, 21 says, but as for Israel, he says, I've spread out my hands all day long to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's what it says in Romans. That's how they translate it in Romans, not what it says. He's quoting Isaiah 65 that says this. He says, I permitted myself, God speaking, I allowed myself to be sought by those who didn't ask for me. Who's he talking about? Israel. No. Gentiles. 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 Yeah. Okay. I permitted myself to be found by those who didn't even seek me. This is the Gentiles. I said, here I am. Here I am. They didn't even look for me. I went like, hey, here I am. And I allowed them to find me. I've spread. The word is parasti, yadai kol hayom Yisrael, parasti, which means to break apart or to spread. I spread, I broke apart my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which isn't good. Let's see what that way that isn't good is. Continually, these are Jews. These are Jews. And he says, they walk in a way that's not good. Well, what, what way is that? Who continually provoke me to my face. Just like Zimri and, and Cosby did. Offering sacrifices in gardens. In other words, Gentile worship. And burning incense on bricks. In other words, Gentile worship who sit among graves, Jews can't go in gra on graves. They become unclean. Right. In other words, Gentile ways and worship, who eat pig's flesh. Oh, really? That's what bothers you, God, that Jews are eating pig? That's what bothers you? Yeah. Because it's the way of the Gentile. And the broth of unclean meat is in their pots. What are they eating? They're eating like Gentiles. That's what it says in Isaiah. But Paul quoting it, they know what he's quoting. We don't. We're ignorant. They knew what he was saying. He's quoting this passage that says, the Gentiles, God went, hey, here I am. But the Jews, he loves them so much that all day long he's got his hands out to them, even though they're acting like Gentiles. And then in Romans 9, who nobody believes, that's not what it means. In Romans 9, which nobody believes, by the way, nobody believes this. Nobody, I've never met, ever met a Jew or a Gentile believer who believes this in their heart. Truly. I'm telling the truth in Messiah. One. I'm not lying. Two. That I have great sorrow and constant grief in my heart. By the way, he adds there another one. He says, <coughs> the Holy Spirit bearing witness to what I'm saying. So there's actually three, but I didn't write it down because I ran out of space. And he says, I have great sorrow and constant grief in my heart. I could wish that I were going to hell for the Jewish people. I would do that. Dude. It doesn't come across like that in the Greek, obviously, with some crazy Jew yelling. But that's what he's saying. He's saying, I wish I could be accursed, cut off from Messiah for the sake of my countrymen, my brothers according to the flesh, who are Israelites, 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 northern Israel, southern Israel. No Gentiles here. There's not two houses, and one of them is Gentile and one of them is Jewish. That is demonic. This is all of Israel who are Israelites, 
to whom belong the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the Torah, the services. That's all the services. How did you do services? How do you run a service? Like a church or like God gave it to Israel? And the promises who have the fathers and from whom came the Messiah, the Jewish people. Would you go to hell for the Jews? <laughs> I've never met anybody who would. I wouldn't. Would you give up your salvation if you could see the Jewish people saved? <clears throat> I used to think I would. I, used to, I, I loved this verse. And then I started talking to people. I made the mistake of starting to talk to people. And I mentioned it, and they're like, oh, you're foolish. It doesn't say that. It says it does. I, I'm reading it. It says it. It says it. That I would cu be cut off from the side, go to hell, if I could, you know, for the sake of my Jewish brothers. No, brother, it doesn't say that. And, but nobody ever showed me anything different. I knew that's what it said the first time I read it. It's, <laughs> it's pretty obvious. obvious. But can you say that? Not about myself. Can you say that? That you would give up your salvation for the Jewish people? Because that's God's heart. It's at least Paul's heart. Right. Paul, the one who started Christianity. <laughs> That's Shaul's heart. So how did it go from that to you're not even allowed to do Jewish stuff in most churches? How did that happen? Okay. We've talked about that before. But I want you to see that that reaching all day long to the Jewish people, that's God's jealousy. And that's God's heart. And we're supposed to be getting at least closer to that I mean, I had, I had this when I was young. That's How old are you? Yeah, 18. I got born again when I was 19. And by the time I was 20, I had this. I had it. I had it inside my heart. And then Messianic Jews took it out of me. Because they said, no, that's too much. No, 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 no. Uh, listen, we need to be all inclusive. And they started turning it into a like, you have a real hatred toward Christians. And I believed it. And it was foolishness. The truth is, this is Shaul talking, not me. And this is what he says. So this is what we're supposed to be shooting for because he's quoting Isaiah talking about Jews and Gentiles. That God just went and said, showed himself to the Gentiles and just said, hey, hey, here I am. But not to the Jews. To the Jews, they were doing Gentile stuff and it broke God's heart. And he says, there needs to be a jealousy for Israel, not jealousy of Israel. And that's the difference. What we see in the world, especially when we hang out with believers, I'm sorry to say, is jealousy of Israel. I cannot tell you how many pastors, assistant pastors, Believers have said to me, I just, I wish I had been born a Jew. And they said, oh, you have so much as a Jew. We don't have that. Or I've actually had a couple that were brave enough to say to me, I, I really have a jealousy for the Jewish people. And yet, when they speak, they never do anything to lift the Jews up. They just want what the Jews have. And that's the truth. That's jealousy of Israel. And by the way, it says it in Scripture that God doesn't like that and that it exists. Isaiah 11. It will happen in that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria all the way to the islands of Greece. He will lift up a standard for the Gentiles and assemble the banished ones of Israel. All right, so he lifts up a standard for the Gentiles. Okay? All right, well, by the way, that banner, that standard, is the resurrection. That's what the rabbis say. But who's it for? Gentiles. The Gentiles. So they can see. And then it says, and assemble the banished ones of Israel, bringing both Jews and Gentiles in, and will gather the dispersed of the Jews, Judah, 
the other part of Israel, from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim, oh, what is that? Will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah. And that's what we're seeing. Listen, you want to believe in the two house nonsense that Ephraim is really the Gentiles, that they think they're Gentiles, but they're not really Gentiles, they're from one of the ten tribes? Fine. You want to believe that? Then you better apply, apply this to you because you're Ephraim. That means you're, you might have a jealousy of Jews. But if you don't believe that nonsense, the other part of Israel, which is Ephraim, is jealous of Judah. And God does not like that. Not jealousy of Jews, jealousy for the Jews. That's God's bride. That's God's bride. The jealousy inside Israel is called, in the New Testament, zealous. It's a horrible translation. It has done a lot of damage because there's hundreds of teachings out there on the internet that talk about how we should be zealous for God and zealous for the Torah, zealous for the Lord, etc., etc., etc. They're all wrong because it's not zealous. Zealous is not according to Torah. <coughs> jealous is. What Pinchas did was not zealous. It was jealous. It was pure jealousy for God. He doesn't want to see anything offend God with his woman. That's it. But look what it says. Joel 2.18. And I want you to show, I'm showing you this so you can see where they got the word zealous from. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. That's the way they translate it. Guess what word it is? Kina. What does kina mean? Jealous. It's not zealous. It's jealous. But they translate it like that. Why? How are you going to go have a crusade and march 52,000 soldiers 10,000 miles to slaughter Arabs and Jews unless you are zealous for Christ? And that's basically where it came from. And then it built and it built and it built and it built. And it became like a whole thing in the, in the, in the religion of Christianity. There's no such thing as zealous. It's God being jealous for his land and so he can have pity on his people. Then in Acts chapter 21, they translate it zealous, but it's not. <coughs> the following day, <clears throat> Shaul, Paul, went in with us to Jacob and all the elders, and he related all the things that God had done among the Gentiles. We're Judaizing the Gentiles, he says in Acts chapter 16. We're Judaizing the Gentiles. He says it over and over and over and over. Galatians, Acts five times, he says it over and over again. 1 Corinthians Chapter 7 says it over and over. We're Judaizing the Gentiles. And these guys are, woohoo, that's awesome. Awesome. And they, they, they glorify God uh, through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. Yes, that's what we want. And then they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who are emunot, believers. There's no such word as Christian in the Bible. It's emunot, those who have faith, faithful ones, believers. The word belief and faith is the same in Hebrew. It's aman, emunah. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, etc. Emunah, believers. Those among the Jews who are believers and they are all jealous for the Torah. How can they be jealous for the Torah? What does that mean? How do you be jealous for the Torah? Because that's the jealousy that's inside that's coming out. 
That's the jealousy that's inside the Jewish people that God wants to pull out. It's Torah. God showed his jealousy for his bride by giving Torah. How did he do that? Numbers chapter, what is it, 6? Sota, the water of jealousy. He says, if there's a Jewish man, a Jewish man, not, some, not just anybody, a Jewish man, and he suspects his wife of adultery. What does he do? Go bring her and, and, and uh, bring her to the temple and say, stone her? No, bring her to the temple, get the priest, do this stuff as a picture, and thus fulfill the Torah of Sota, the Torah of the bitter waters. Why? Because a Ruach Kina has come upon him. What does that mean? Spirit, spirit of jealousy. That's the spirit of God. God is El Kina. So the man is acting out the picture of God. The woman is acting out the picture of Israel. Act out the picture. Show him what it's about. And do Torah. That's the jealousy that's inside. Now, if you, I mean, if you're just, if you don't do Torah, you just do like little sprinklings of it, who cares? Do a little more. Do a little more. Do a little more. Do a little more every day. Who cares? And everything that you do of Torah, and it's not just festivals and, and, and Shabbat, everything that you do of Torah, have it talk to you. And you'll get to know God better and better and better and better every day. It's a long growth process. That's the jealousy that's inside. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is why, all the way back to the beginning, God said this weird phrase. I'm going to go all the way back, I think. Maybe I'm not. There we go. All the way back to the beginning. He says this weird phrase. My jealousy inside of them. That's the motivating thing for all of it. It wasn't Pinchas' jealousy. That, that, that wasn't it. It was the jealousy inside all of Israel, which is what? God's Torah. That's his ways. That's what he does, so that's what we should do. It's that simple. Here's God. Here's us. If we match, awesome. If we don't, fix it. And match. Do Torah. And then you'll learn something. That's God's jealousy. That's why he's jealous of Israel. Because he wants to have a people on the earth that all the world can look at and go, wow, that's what God's like. That's pretty cool. Let's pray. Abba, there's just no way to even begin to thank you for choosing to put us as part of your bride. You chose to insert us into your bride, to be part of your bride. I thank you, Abba, for spreading your Torah, for making that jealousy that you put inside of us Jews <coughs> to come out. And I ask that you to blow on that fire so that that fire, that heat of that fire of jealousy would start coming up in the Gentiles who know you so they can be proper in your body. They can be saying the right thing, doing the right thing, thinking the right thing, teaching the right thing in your body that is all about your Torah and how Yeshua is that Torah made flesh. The Torah made flesh. And I thank you, Abba, that the birth pangs are coming. I thank you that the birth pangs are coming. I ask that you ready us for them, that you prepare us for them by teaching us about your day and showing us your day. In the name of Yeshua, have mercy on your body. Have mercy on your people. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Shabbat Shalom.